Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Another week has passed where we find ourselves swept along by the currents of history, not by the predictable rhythms of quadrennial events, but by sudden, unanticipated heavals, sharp pivot points in a path that one way or another ends in a different America. Substantially contemporaneous with President Joe Biden's announcement that he would not seek another term, Vice President Kamala Harris burst into action. Within 48 hours, Harris had effectively sewn up the nomination, dispelling the perplexing questions about various scenarios, the possibility of an open convention, and the prospect of fierce intra-party rivalries. Just like that, the electoral landscape was restabilized. Harris, whose 2020 candidacy had fizzled out before Iowa due to a lackluster and poorly executed campaign, followed up her swift clinching of the nomination with a series of dynamic rallies that directly took it to Donald Trump and electrified many Democrats. Her messaging was sharp and unambiguous, her tone pitch perfect. Above all, she exuded an upbeat confidence that starkly contrasted with the Republican ticket's dark narrative of American decline. Far more challenging days are ahead for Harris, and the campaign remains, at best, a toss-up. Yet her dynamic start has overshadowed the previous fortnight of Trump and Republican gains. For now, it also has left Republicans bewildered, with their initial attacks on the vice president failing to gain significant traction. To analyze the remarkable turnaround in the presidential election and consider whether it's a lasting change or a temporary sugar high, We welcome three of the most respected and astute political commentators in the country. And they are Jonah Goldberg, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Dispatch, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he holds the ASNES Chair in Applied Liberty, a weekly columnist for the Los Angeles Times and my colleague there, and a nationally syndicated columnist since 2000 as well, and he hosts the popular and really excellent podcast, The Remnant, with Jonah Goldberg. Jonah, thanks very much for being here. Your check is in the mail. Thank you. (laughs) Ali Vitali, the Capitol Hill correspondent for NBC News, where she's covered national politics for eight years, every major election from the campaign trail since 2016, and her first book, Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House, is in substantial part about Kamala Harris's first year as vice president, and her prior, I think it's fair to say, ill-fated 2020 campaign for the White House. So I think we'll be talking a little bit about that book as we go forward. And Ali, thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Harry. Always a pleasure. And the Rick Wilson. Rick Wilson is a political consultant turned political writer and a co-founder of The Lincoln Project. A lifelong Republican who became an independent, Rick was an early Trump critic, and he's turned his expertise in the dark arts into a steady onslaught of devastating online ads highlighting the 45th president's iniquity. Since leaving politics, Rick has published two books, Everything Trump Touches Dies and Running Against the Devil. Welcome, as always, Rick Wilson. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We are in the middle of one of the most impressive political fortnights since Obama and maybe well before Kamala Harris goes from being in the mix with strong voices such as Obama calling for some sort of open competitive process. He, In fact, he doesn't endorse her till this morning, we tape on Friday, to sewing up the nomination and securing the endorsements of her main rivals in 48 hours. How did she pull it off? Stunning reversal, especially as someone who's covered her for so long, because I think for the first two years of her vice presidency, all we heard were criticisms and concerns. I was hearing them privately. Certainly we were hearing people air them publicly. A lot of that 
came around the role that she was playing or to the criticism of some not playing around the U.S.-Mexico border and on the issue of immigration, I think one of the things that I parse through in my book is the idea that in being historic as the first black female vice president, people expected more from her. But the role of vice president is not to do more. It's to be a good partner and often just be behind the scenes as a message amplifier. I think the biggest change in the way that other people have explained this moment to me of why Democrats are now suddenly not just comfortable, but energized by Kamala Harris is this idea that She's now got a portfolio of issues, specifically in reproductive health care, that really lend to her as an authentic messenger. That's true on black maternal mortality. That's through on abortion access. Voting rights is yet another piece of that, despite the fact that it's impossible to pass through Congress. The issue set has moved more towards her sweet spot. And so that's why we saw a little more comfort around the coronation. But again, no one was more surprised than me to watch all of these Democrats come out and act as if all those years of concern never happened. It was really stunning. It felt to me more like, um, which is an interesting point. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I hadn't really thought about it that way. It seemed to me that as someone who thought it would be smarter and better for the Democrats to have something like an open process, I don't think I completely appreciated how unbelievably difficult that would be psychologically for the Democrats insofar as it is a painful thing to force a president off a ticket. I understand that the going talking point is that this that he's a modern day George Washington and he did this for purely selfless reasons. But I think the sand ran out of the hourglass for the selflessness argument um, in a lot of respects. And it was always going to be difficult, if not impossible, to sidestep Harris if she fought the idea. And the fact that she didn't, it just made it such an easy place to settle after all that chaos. And I had not appreciated fully as someone who's just enjoying watching the chaos, how hungry both the elites in the party and the rank and file were to stop the acrimony and stop the bitterness and unify once they pulled off the thing that they agreed that they ultimately had to pull off. And so I think that like it was more inevitable than I had appreciated. And the fact that she played it very smartly, I think the thing that really changed the dynamic was when they started leaking and they clearly were leaking it. Maybe Ali was one of the people who got leaked to her was putting forward the list of vice presidential candidates, which all of a sudden changed this incentive structure for a lot of her competitors to be more, you know, like I don't want to like be the one to cost the Democrats the, the election. And given that it looks like it's going to be Harris anyway, I better fall in line too. And so it had this galvanic catalytic effect of expediting the endorsements even faster to the point where, you know, Joe Manchin was left standing there like a big dog whose food bowl had been moved (laughs) thinking, well, wait a second. I thought we had open process. Someone said something about an open process. And eventually he was like, yeah, I'm not even a Democrat. This is a pretty heavy lift. No one's returning my calls. And so it just became a done deal. Do you know what, though? I think you hit on something that's so important, which is this idea of like, As someone who was talking to a lot of Democrats elected during the interim three weeks of hell, I'll call them nicely, the freneticness and the panic is so and was so exhausting that I think there was a little bit of that, too. This idea of like, oh, my God, this has been horrible for the party. Let's line up. The second piece of it is they did not want to be seen as disrespecting a black woman, especially as black women voters have been so central, so loyal to their coalition. But then I also think there's a third piece of it, too, which you sort of hint at this idea that Joe Biden came out and endorsed her. And not only would it have looked like they were surpassing and overlooking the first woman of color vice president, but also that they were saying, "Okay, Joe Biden, we just forced you out. And also now We're saying pass the torch, but we want to control who you pass it to. I think Biden's role in this is actually really important for sort of stilling the waters around elected Washington and coming out so early and immediately and saying, yep, we're going to go for my vice president for all the structural reasons, political benefit reasons, all the other reasons. I'm just going to make it clear. This is my girl in this situation. And I do think that carried a lot of weight, too, because people do respect the president. I agree with that. I do think the most interesting 30 minutes in modern politics in the last 20 years are the 30 minutes between his announcement that he was resigning and then his endorsement of Harris, because he could have very easily put that in his announcement. And 
I just would like to know what the conversation was because sort of the logic that you're pointing to also points to the fact that like he's been going around bragging about how he appointed the first female vice president, first black female vice president. That's part of his argument about his legacy and his accomplishments. Yeah. And for him to throw her under the bus contradicts his own narrative about himself. So like why that delay? I just maybe they had some theory about it that I don't know. And they always intended to endorse. But it's just interesting to me. It is. Everything you guys say is true. But in advance, those were the reasons why it sort of had to be Kamala. But there were reasons why it couldn't be Kamala. And it had everything to do with her sort of lackluster at best performance as a candidate and a vice president. Sure, part of it's the issue set, but it even seemed a little churlish, like, oh, I don't want the immigration. I've gone back and listened to, with a couple exceptions, including that one recycled ad. She was a fairly banal, I would say, candidate in 2020. And pretty much from the time of the debate, she just became incandescent, called on something that we didn't know she had, and she was crisp and clear and good-humored and upbeat and pitch perfect. I think that, that people didn't necessarily expect, and that certainly it was part of what was electrifying about those 48 hours after. In 2019, she had these moments in the debates where all of a sudden she would like hit a grand slam but most of the time, she was like a 125 hitter. She'd been through two big statewide races. She'd been in public life. But she wasn't able to dominate the stage, especially in a year where you had Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden, Pete, but all these other people who had their sort of individual slices of the Democratic psyche. What I have seen in the last four days, five days, is you know a pretty happy warrior. And that does matter in politics, this sort of feeling like you are, you're in this fight for the right reasons, you're joyous in your approach to it. And, and look, for for all of Do Donald Trump's campaign charisma, he's not a guy with a lot of joy. He's not a guy who who gives people a sense of like, wow, this campaign could actually be something that inspires me. And I don't know if her having a pretty rough three years, and let's all admit it, she's had a pretty rough three years as VP. It has not been easy. I don't think she's had a lot of easy days in that job. Maybe it made her harder and sharper and ready for this challenge. And thus far, and I say this a lot, you know, no candidate who runs for president ever knows or expects what's going to happen. There's always an externality. She will have bad days ahead. She will screw up one day. She will make a mistake. You know, and she'll have to fix it, clean it up. It's going to be hard. There are going to be bad days ahead. But, you know, when you start off with a series of pretty good days like this, and she set a bar for her performance, I think, I mean, maybe that gives her a little bit of confidence going into what's going to be a really, really loud and ugly fight ahead. True. She's had this kind of X factor that even presidential candidates, only a real rare subset uh, have. And I think it does have to do with her sort of confident and upbeat tone. But let me take it from the other side and the point Rick is making. It's really early. But given all the excitement on the ground, you might have expected to see greater movement in the polls. Trump is still three points ahead within this standard of error, et cetera, and still has historically high, I mean, not great, 46%, but for him, as high as it gets, approval ratings. So it hasn't translated, at least yet, it seems, into movement in the election itself. Should we be surprised at that? We're still very early in the process. I, I'm not surprised. We didn't get in the field till Monday night. And we've got some early data back, but I'm not ready to confidently say that's positive for her. But when you look at the how, how the numbers have closed, yes, she may be behind Trump in some states, but she's not six, seven, eight points behind Trump. She's now one or two points behind Trump. So, you know, and we'll see. Again, it is very early going, but the importance of launching with a strong, you know, first week like this, I think has rebuilt some of the Democratic voter intensity. We'll see how those numbers play out in the next couple of weeks. It certainly seems to be rebuilding African-American voter intensity uh, for the Democrats. And I think the contrast of her great week and Trump having to play defense with J.D. Vance all week has not been... It's not been a great week for Trump. And he had a lot of good weeks in a row. Let's be honest. He had five, yeah. six weeks of really good luck. By not doing anything. 
Right. Actually, Trump tends to benefit from not doing anything. Exactly. He right. tends to his numbers tend to go up when he doesn't talk. That's been the sort of rule of thumb for rank punditry for a while, which is that when the country is talking about Joe Biden, it's good for Donald Trump. And when the country's talking about Donald Trump, it's good for Joe right. Biden. Mm -hmm. And the problem with his age thing was that it meant it was going to be the only conversation going forward for a long time because he could not dispel concerns. And I think some of the raw excitement was just like, I think people had downgraded their expectations so much that they forgot what it's like to actually have a candidate, virtually any candidate who can campaign, who can make an argument, who can do 10 hour days. Right. And like, it's sort of like, um, I had sinus surgery of last year and for five days I couldn't breathe through my nose and it was horrible. And then just being able to breathe through my nose, I felt yeah. like I had done a kilo of Coke. I mean, I was just like going nuts <laughs> just to see a candidate who flawed as she is. I mean, I think she's a flawed candidate. I don't think she's the best Democrat to put up against Donald Trump for all sorts of you know reasons, but she can campaign. She can make an argument. She can put some energy, some verb in it, And people are like, Oh my gosh, we could actually win. We could actually run against this guy. And I think some of the exuberance was just stemmed from that. The uh, kilo cocaine comment is a very good segue to one other aspect I want to think about her, which is her prosecutor's credentials. Because in 2020, one of the things that happened, very different time, wake of George Floyd, but she actually alienated African-American voters with her starchy, tough on crime past and her sort of prosecutorial bona fides. Which she had, you know, convictions rose 20% on her watch when she was a DA, gun crime convictions and the like. But she's got this baggage now. What do you think is the right way forward for her as a quote unquote former prosecutor? Is that the role she wants to play? Prosecutor? Can I say the primary is a completely different landscape than a general election for so many reasons. I mean, Politically, it made sense why black voters were shying away from her, especially in states like South Carolina. I remember many a conversation with Jim Clyburn, even before he endorsed Biden, talking about why he didn't think Kamala Harris and Cory Booker specifically were, weren't making waves with the black electorate in that state. It's because Biden had a lot of goodwill with those voters, both because of the role he played with Obama, but also because they knew him longest and best. Harris now is not in a primary situation. It means that issues of race and gender, which you know I like to focus on as a secondary thing to the politics, it's completely different in a general election because if you're a Democrat, you're voting Democrat. If you're a Republican, you're voting Republican and everyone's playing for that 6% in the middle. For Harris, that makes it easier to not debate the idea of being a prosecutor, though I will say, at least when she ran in 2020, the complaints that I often heard from immigration groups, for example, was that she was not as progressive as they wanted her to be in that prosecutor's record. Of course, black voters had their own issues there. All of that is really important. But right now, if everything is just how does it compare to Trump, who is a felon and she is not and she is a lawyer and a prosecutor, I mean, that is the way that Democratic voters look at it. I think she should definitely lean into her record on all this. I mean, just one point about the South Carolina primary stuff. The other thing that sort of puts a magnet next to the compass of people who've been around for 30 years following politics is like when I was growing up, for want of a better shorthand, the black left, right? The Jesse Jackson faction of mm -hmm. the Democratic Party was definitionally the left wing of the party. That's no longer the case. The backbone of the party are those middle-aged black women voters who are to the right of a lot of the sort of barista socialists that dominate a lot of the conversation. They're not Bernie bros. And I think that one of the reasons why they were skeptical of Harris was they didn't think she could win because she presented to left wing in a lot of different ways. I think they had a similar problem with Cory Booker and they had a similar problem with Pete Buttigieg and they had a similar problem with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. You know, the smart thing about Joe Biden, which saved him in the end, was that he presented more moderate. And it was bizarre to me that so many people in 2020 wanted to run in the Bernie Sanders lane, leaving this space open to Joe Biden, who was reassuring. No one could say he was a radical because they knew him. Right. There was nothing othering about him and all that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people picked up on that. On the prosecutor point, I think the prosecutor versus the felon stuff was very smart and very good when she debuted. It's a great thing to do at Del in the Delaware headquarters. It was a signal to very committed Democrats that she gets it. 
She's going to go after Trump. She's the one to go after Trump. That's great messaging to get the party in line, the true believers, right? To get them enthusiastic and to start making all those donations that she got. I would pivot a bit. Some of the throwaway lines are great and she could, she should use them in part because they just piss off Trump and it's always good to piss off Trump. But the voters who really want to see Donald Trump prosecuted and think he's a felon and, and all of these things, which I largely agree with, they're voting for Harris already. It's that 6% that Ali is talking about who think that the prosecutions are to one extent or another political, or they just don't care very much about them. They care about like inflation and crime and immigration and all those kinds of things. And so I think reviving the mantle of the tough, you know, California's top cop, which she used to call herself, would be very smart to reassure those people. And if she gets attacked a little bit by the hardcore left, that's good for her. Yeah, sister soldier, right? Yeah. Well, but right. let me ask you, Rick, about because that's one way to look at it. But is it possible that her entry into the race changes it fundamentally? So the, uh, the relentless focus we've had on the 6% and sometimes it's seen more like 0.6% is obsolete and it becomes more of a turnout election. Has it changed the fundamental dynamics of the route to victory for each side? Uh, I don't think so, Harry. And I'll say, I'll tell you why. The greatest Democratic turnout mechanism right now is Donald Trump. He is going to drive Democratic turnout to record, if not extraordinary levels this year. We see that time and again in our research. The other thing we're sp seeing right now is that Harris is not scaring off what we call the Bannon line voters, those folks who are who are largely in that small but meaningful cohort of Republican voters who tend to be more pro-choice, tend to be more higher income, tend to be more affluent, more suburban. She's not scaring them off yet. Now, I'm not saying she couldn't, but because those voters tend to have a larger pro-choice overlay, that issue is driving them very hard, and they look at her as someone solid on that question. I don't think Vance helped Trump a lot in that regard in the last, you know, five days. <laughs> yeah. I think that's been a been a little bit of a mess for him. Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking, I know. <laughs> um, but and I think, you know, the endless number of clips of Trump saying I, I got rid of Roe v. Wade also moves those voters. I'm not saying that coalition is completely locked yet. There's a lot of work to be done on that for her and for other groups, but it's certainly something that I don't think Trump easily gets them back. I think she could lose them, but I'm not sure Trump can get them. And as for the Democratic you know, mechanism, I think as both Ali and Jenna were saying, the sort of sense of relief, the sort of sense of, oh, thank God he finally made a decision, the sense that there's a candidate out there who can go out and take the fight to Trump, I think that is, I mean, look, we've got 102 days to go. It's going to be sustainable, I think, if she has cadence, momentum, energy. And again, I know this is the weirdest thing for someone as notoriously cynical as myself to say, but that sense of like joy and happy warrior and that she's having fun in this in this battle, that really matters. And then the, the attacks on her are like, how oh, dare she dance or laugh? <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the short time frame helps her. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, Jenna. Let's take this as a closeout for you, Jenna and Allie. So drawing from what Rick just said, has her emergence essentially just undone the damage of the last several weeks and returned the contest to the kind of jump ball it was before? Or is her candidacy fundamentally different from Biden's in a way that now fundamentally changes the dynamic? I think some of it is too soon to tell. Like Trump is wildly overspending Harris, at least as of yesterday. I haven't seen any numbers on ads. They're trying really hard to define her before she defines herself. Mm -hmm. That really matters. But I do think it certainly, it changes the dynamics of the race in some fundamental ways, I think, insofar as, first of all, it was looking like Trump could pick up Virginia and New Hampshire and those places. I don't think that's a thing anymore. And I think it puts North Carolina closer to being in play because of, you know, the research triangle, upper middle class, bourgeois kind of suburbs and the larger black population. But Time will tell. I also think it changes things because the argument was Biden's too old and Trump's energy and strength perceived made him seem like the strong candidate. I think that that dynamic is kind of gone and she can run more of a change election. Why I think she's a flawed candidate in some respects 
is that she's still the second half of the Biden Harris administration. So she can't run away from the unpopular things that happened on the Biden watch in a way some truly new fresh face could. But I don't think it's the same race anymore. Trump can't run against her exactly the way he ran against Harris. Harris can respond in ways that Biden was incapable of. I mean, we forget Biden was asked about abortion, his best issue. He's writing abortions yeah. coattails and he not only buttered it, he said immigrant crime is no big deal because women are raping their sisters in America and we finally beat Medicare. Kamala Harris on her worst day will be orders of magnitude better for those kinds of things. And Trump, I think, was on a glide path to win. He's not on a glide path anymore. And so that, you know, what how we define the fundamental dynamics of the race, it's a political science question. It's a political pro question. But as just sort of common sense, the dynamics are different now. I think you could say, and I've heard this somewhere before, this idea of you exist in the context yeah. of what been. Someone somewhere said you didn't just fall out of the coconut tree. Yeah. And Coco, if I place the quote at some point, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'll give credit. But I think it was Kipling. Yes, of course. Yes. No, but look, it, it's also applicable here, right? It's not just viral and it's not just like people are slapping coconut trees and saying they're coconut pilled because they suddenly support Kamala Harris. She, of course, exists in the context of having been the second part of Biden-Harris and will have to defend the parts of that administration. However, I know a lot of Democrats who feel really good about her defending the Biden-Harris administration, in large part because of the legislation they were able to pass, not just on infrastructure, but on some pieces of the care economy. I think she feels really good about talking about the child tax credit. I think she feels exceptionally good about the issue of abortion, because as Jonah points out, Biden's answer on that, I think, was the thing I heard the most from people, not just because of the way it ended with the Medicare or we killed Medicare part, but because he's a candidate who wasn't even comfortable saying the word abortion. It's why Harris was able to take such a long runway on this issue and have people respond to it. The fact that she is now the key messenger as someone who's covered reproductive access for 10 years I am fascinated by seeing what the first presidential election in the post row universe looks like, because all the other electoral plot points that we have from it show that it's a very salient and energizing issue that Republicans have no idea how to put that genie back in the bottle electorally. And so she is going to take that and run with it. And I think the fact that she's a woman as a messenger on that is exceptionally exciting to the people that I have spoken to. And it's Yes, that changes the dynamics of the race, but also it was always going to be that abortion was going to be the issue that we wait to see be tested in a presidential year. There you have it. And, you know, Biden struck me as a, as a not a great spokesman for that. I, I've always thought of him as being, you know, coming of age like 15 minutes before the 60s. It's still like, you know, these kids and birth control, whatever. It just, he wasn't a powerful spokesperson. Let's spend a few minutes analyzing Joe Biden's decision to drop out of the race. We've talked about it a little already and the decision to endorse. Let me start here because you sort of served it up, Jonah. It is playing, right, as, you know, a George Washington selfless gesture, country and party above overambition. Fair or fulsome, would you say? I think we should show a little grace insofar as it was a hard thing to do and it sucked. He shouldn't have run again in the first place. I think the coup stuff about, you know, Democratic elites had a coup thing is, is, is hot garbage. The voters have been screaming to pollsters for two years, don't run this guy again. And finally, the elites listened to it when it became impossible to deny the problem. This was not led by party elites. They were the final coup de grace on something that had been building for a very long time. That said, I thought his speech was a missed opportunity in a lot of ways. It also sort of demonstrated that he could not have run a real campaign, never mind serve for four more years. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, look, there were some sound bites, and that's what's going to get remembered, and those were fine, you know, the sort of argumentum ad John Meacham, fine. But the stuff in the middle felt like a mini State of the Union address. It was a laundry list of stuff where he was... He came across as a guy who said, you know, trying to make the case that he deserved to be president again because of what he had done, which I understand why he wanted to say it, but I, I think he should have been talked out of it. 
And he never actually explained why I felt there was a little bit of a grumpy old man thing to it, where he was just like never actually said why he was stepping down other than party unity, which runs counter to his larger message about putting country first and all that kind of thing. And at the same time, you give the guy a gold watch early and you shuffle him off the public stage this way. You let him have his say and getting too grumpy and nasty about it. I don't think serves any purposes. The thing kind of spoke for itself, but it is obvious that he had to be persuaded to do the right thing long after it was obvious he should do the right thing. And how all that stuff is remembered depends on a lot of what we learn later and also whether or not Harris wins. I think that's right. And I think that there's a degree to which, like Jonas said, you know, you want to give the guy some grace at this point. Because look, none of us have ever or will ever be in the situation where we are called upon to give up our lifelong dream in the way that he did, knowing that it might not have been good or the right outcome, but knowing that if the debate had gone a different way, he wouldn't have been in that spot. So it's hard when you think about like one inflection point that blows your whole game plan. And Jonah's right. There, there was some filler in the middle of the speech. I do think there were some really nice grace notes in it. And, and, and people should be willing to recognize that this is a, you know, a good man in a hard spot. And I thought the speech was fine. I thought it covered a sense of, of transition and, Biden, for all that he has lost a step or two, is still a reasonably canny political operator. And, you know, he kept framing the democracy question in the speech, which for the good of the campaign side, I think is not was not a bad political angle to take in that. I think it's the speech he had to give. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. <laughs> I mean, that's just plain and simple. My reporting from the Hill for NBC in the days leading up to the weekend Sunday announcement when I left the Hill on Friday we published a story that said Democrats were preparing to make Monday and Tuesday very clear in their pressure campaign, a ramped up day of coming out, saying he should pass the torch. Leadership was thinking about it. I mean, it was going to go from uncomfortably bad to extremely bad if he didn't make this kind of decision. And so I think as much as we talk about the internal emotional ideas and considerations that he was making around having to give up his dream job in real time, like the political pressure was going to be so sustained that impossible, it was not right? lost Just on anybody. Yeah. I mean, the calls I was getting from donors, from electeds, it was it was going to get worse. But that I mean, I hate to be the curmudgeon here, but that runs against the whole modern day George Washington argument, right? He, he wasn't talked into doing it. He was forced into doing it. And we should still have some grace because it sucks to be forced into doing it. But like they leveled all the arguments with him and he wasn't hearing it. And so then they just had to say, we're making you do it because if if you don't do it, we're going to make it impossible for you to win. And you're just going to go down anyways. I look, I don't I disagree with any of that. I do want to say and it sounds like this would be another episode and Joan in particular might but he really hasn't gotten his due for what seems to me to be an extremely successful presidency. He's, he's got numbers of, you know, Jimmy Carter, the first Bush, in the wake of a much more successful record. So query how this stepping away that way shapes his legacy, as it did Washington's, though, though I agree that's the whole soul of Washington's decisions. They wanted him to stay and he stepped away. So it's a little bit the converse. I propose we leave that there for now so we can get to the GOP reaction to him. We've talked about this a little, but there's, they seem very flummoxed. So, Rick, the day after Biden withdrew, you wrote in your substack that a sense of shock is rippling through the Republican Party greater than anything I could have possibly imagined a week ago. It's almost a week later. You think they're still completely on the ropes and scrambling? Look, I think they have still not settled on the way to attack Vice President Harris effectively. I think that Donald Trump is right now doing something that Chris LaCivita and Susie Wiles should be very cautious about. He's on the phone with Kellyanne and Sean Hannity and Chris Ruddy and Brad Parscale and all the other people around the old orbit. And he's doing what he did before. We've seen this before. He, he, he'll, he'll call and go, do you think so-and-so is doing a good job for me? Do you think right. they like me? And that feeling is still out there. That was going on even last night. I was hearing from people in that world. 
the other indicator for me always when Trump's up, I don't hear things out of Trump world. When Trump's down, I do. Mm. And the phone's been off the hook lately. Is that more about him or Vance, though? A lot of it is about Vance. A lot of it is about Vance. A lot of it is like, oh, God, how do we get talked into this bullshit? I mean, you think of it as inconceivable, but Trump, he really it would be in character to dump Vance, right? I don't think it's out of the question, guys. I think Vance better get a food taster at this point. Yeah, to try the Mountain Dews before he does. <laughs> oh, my God. They're going to find their footing, you know, one way or another. But there there are things, you know, different surrogates have tried different kind of dog whistle race angles. Where will they, should they settle in terms of bringing the attack to Harris? Yeah, I mean, if you look at that McCormick ad in Pennsylvania, I think that is going to be the template for a lot of this. She's just said and did a lot of things that if you don't know anything else about her, that fills in the vacuum and defines her, which is why they should push back on it. Spell it out a little bit, please. Oh, you know, the stuff about agreeing that we should get rid of beef and that kind of stuff and the- Fracking. Fracking. That's not great in Pennsylvania. Huge in Pennsylvania. Right, right. The stuff about getting rid of private insurance. I mean, there's no end to like soundbite stuff that you could use against her, particularly from the 2020 primary. And I, we're going to see a lot of those kind of quotes a lot. You see a lot of making fun of her laugh stuff, which I think doesn't have the oomph that they think it does. It's, it's the kind of thing that works really well with people who already love Trump. But if you already want to hear misogynistic, sexist, weird stuff like that, then yeah, that's going to work really well on you. But I actually don't think, and the Speaker of the House seems to share this assessment based on what he told his colleagues in their caucus meeting, I don't think that people coming out and calling her a DEI hire is the way to bring that 6% of swing voters, I agree the people that. who yeah. voted for Nikki Haley and are looking for somebody, anybody, but not Trump. That is certainly not how you get them on board. But clearly we've all followed Trump for long enough. And I, I did the 2015 campaign, right? So like I, we're all here. We know what he uses to go after his opponents, but we also know the way he goes after women. I mean, with Hillary Clinton, it was she lacks the strength and stamina to be president. She doesn't look presidential. We saw it with Carly Fiorina, that face. That stuff doesn't really work. People call that out. And actually, Democrats have gotten smarter and the, the cultural landscape for girl boss, feminist, whatever culture has made it cool to be a powerful woman. That's not something Hillary had the benefit of in 2008, and she barely had the benefit of it in 2016. But it is something that Kamala Harris will have the benefit of now. And I know that we think, oh, the Taylor Swift universe of voters, like it's untested. And I know that an election is not going to hang on that. But I also think that it really undersells the energy that women voters feel when you see someone attack them for being childless cat ladies as if that's a bad thing. I think that we undersell that kind of talk. And to put a finer point on it, I always think about gender as like the touchy-feely stuff that is inquantifiable and thusly easy to put aside. But I do think that if you think that gender is not part and parcel to this campaign, then you weren't watching the RNC. Because masculinity and hyper machismo were the central features more than anything else on that stage. And men are driving the gender gap. So gender is so central to this. You know, Ali, that, that, I think that's right. I, I had a conversation with someone today who's, who basically made the point. He goes, you know, you don't know that Taylor Swift could activate or all these celebrities could activate a cohort of, of low propensity Democrats. You just don't know that. I'm like, you know what we didn't know in 2016? We didn't know that Donald Trump could activate a large cohort of low propensity Republicans who only yeah. knew him from watching The Apprentice. Is Brat the new apprentice? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Look, all true. I'll just say, I think every this there's been undertones to what all of you have said. There's no disagreement here. It's like, it's so bizarre to say it, thinking of the vantage point of two weeks ago, but there is a feeling that I think some Dems are getting a little cocksure not the most level-headed ones, but attacks are coming, bad days are coming, and they will, they'll fasten on better. But the fact that they're having so much trouble, besides endorsing the the Rick Wilson point, that they just didn't have a plan B, they were going to run against Biden and own Biden, also shows that there's a particular dynamic or chemistry between Trump and Harris, and in 2024, as the, you know, as you're saying, Ali, that 
it's a bit of a hard political problem. You got you can't just go to the obvious routes and you got to be delicate. And they, they have not figured it out. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we peek behind the wine label to see who lays claim to the best Chardonnay, California or Burgundy, France. As we've touched on before, Wines from the U.S. are classified by the grape, while French wines are classified by the region. In France, the region of Burgundy produces some of the finest Chardonnays known as white Burgundies, which are almost always made from Chardonnay grapes. To put it simply, when you see a white wine from Burgundy, you know it's a Chardonnay. The cooler weather and cloud cover in Burgundy creates wines that have less of the rich fruit flavors you might find in a California Chardonnay, But what white burgundies lack in fruitiness, they make up for in highly aromatic and complex flavors that range from tropical notes and crisp green apples to fresh jasmine and exotic spices. And you don't have to book a flight to France to taste them either. Just swing into your local Total Wine & More and ask one of our guides for a tour of our white burgundies at a great value. Swinging over to California Chardonnays, you'll notice that they tend to be rich, full-bodied whites that have undergone malolactic fermentation and heavier doses of new oak. But that's actually a great thing because it helps to create a creamy, buttery feel and flavors of butterscotch, vanilla, and ripe tropical fruits with medium acidity, which make for an ideal bottle. So when the mood calls for Chardonnay and you're torn between California and Burgundy, come talk to our guides at Total Wine & More, where it's always easy to meet in the middle and grab a bottle of each. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. Okay, how about a minute on vice president before we get to our talking five? So maybe let's just do the obvious. We know the people who are in play, Mark Kelly, Tim Walls, Andy Bashir, Roy Cooper, Josh Shapiro, maybe J.B. Pritzker. What do you think and what would you recommend? This is not to predict, but any general analytic thoughts about the vice presidential choice, what it might show about her, how they're thinking about it, how they should be thinking about it, et cetera. There's a tactical argument that disappeared largely, I think, this year for the Republicans because they didn't need Ohio. They weren't going to lose Ohio without J.D. Vance, who frankly was an underperformer in 2022 in Ohio. But if you think about a Mark Kelly, you have a border state guy a strong immigration guy, a guy with military service and military background, no matter where you feel on the gun control debate. Astronaut. Astronaut, right. You've also got the Gabby Gifford storyline. There's a lot there in looking at a guy like an Andy Bashir, a guy like Josh Shapiro. I think he's he's very popular. He's been very well regarded. I think that there is a sense from what a senior Democrat told me was like, let's not go with two risk factors in this race and say, we're going to have a woman. and Yeah, no, a woman and a Jewish candidate. There's a sense in some of the Democratic hierarchy that that is too risky. So look, we'll see. I think if I was picking it, I'd pick Kelly because I want to put Arizona into the mix. The DSCC just groaned so hard having to do that Senate race again. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. But you know what? He serves out the rest of the term. A Fontes or somebody else is going to be great. It's not the worst thing in the world for them to be able to put a swing state I think he would put it, help put it into play pretty meaningfully. So that's my, that's my two cents. I'm glad you didn't mention Buttigieg because I think he would be a disastrous pick. But I'm torn between sort of my is and my ought on this insofar as the fact that I think Rick's entirely correct that people are scared to put a Jewish candidate on, but like that is not a great reflection on the Democratic Party right now. It's the reality that they have, though. Come on, um, though. You know, uh, I Mr. Goldberg is just, put it this it's way. just the, too much. <laughs> the, the national discourse in this country, um, cable news and whatnot, if Trump couldn't put a Jewish candidate on the ticket because of anti-Semitism in the Republican Party, the conversation would be a nonstop drumbeat about how this confirms all the priors of liberals about how they view the Republican Party 
Instead, everyone sort of talks about this in sort of purely pragmatic antiseptic terms, and I have a problem with it. That said, I agree that it's a problem, and shame on the Democrats for having it. But if, and there's a huge if, if Shapiro had data and facts and an argument to be made that he could actually deliver Pennsylvania. Oh, it'd be here. I it's mean, a no-brainer yeah. to me. Yeah, and right. Close the door. But the same could be said for Roy Cooper, right? And North Carolina. Pennsylvania, a bigger plum. I, also I agree, Arizona. but yes. And, and, yeah. But the only other point okay. I would make is that, you know, I'm someone who thinks that she should tack right. She should sister soldier the hell out of her positioning and just take these issues, a lot of issues away from Trump. Putting Shapiro on the ticket and telling the sort of hardcore anti-Israel people, a lot of whom I don't think are going to vote for Harris anyway, deal with it. And it would would be a pretty strong girl boss flex move. But I can understand wanting to do a safer play. So I think Kelly makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I think will be a lot of fun is Kelly has an identical twin, so you could use him as a fake surrogate. <laughs> um, just put him out there. John Fetterman like, has no idea what's coming. Yeah. And then all the conspiracy theories. How was he in two states at once? <laughs> uh, I think it would be great. The only thing I'll say on the VP stuff is the thing that I have heard is if you look at on our network, on other networks, when we make the graphic of who's in the play on this, it's hard to ignore the fact that when you look at the graphic on my network and other networks, all the guys who are in contention for this are guys and all mostly white. I mean, Wes Moore, I think, is mostly out of the conversation. Gretchen Whitmer seems to want to take herself out of the conversation. Gina Raimondo is in to the extent that she's like in the talk bubble. But like in terms of who's serious in this, I think we all have heard that she's not serious in this. But that's a feature, not a bug of at least the way the Harris campaign is thinking about it in large part because they already feel like they can be barrier breaking with who she is in terms of her right. identity as a candidate, that they also realize that they are going to have to add balance, whether it's balance from a policy perspective, a geography perspective, or also just sort of a placating factor. And several people who were involved with the Obama pick of Biden have said to me that as much as it was adding a gray beard on foreign policy and making it clear that someone had bona fides in the Senate, it was also a matter of Biden wasn't saddled with the same questions around race that Obama was. And that's critical here, too. Exactly. And, and that's the riposte to Jonah, I think. It's, it's different if Trump's doing it from if Harris. All right, we'll leave it there. We may know by next week. We've got one minute left. Our final Talking Five feature. We take a question. We each have to answer it in five words or fewer. So right now, the sort of moniker out there in prize fight terms is the prosecutor versus the felon. What would be an alternative tagline, uh, five words or fewer, for the Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump contest? Happy warrior versus cranky grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Safety over chaos. Gen Z taglines versus Facebook comment arguments. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I'm going fat, old, ugly versus opposite. Thank you so much, Jonah, Ali, and Rick. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content, including my preliminary take on Biden's withdrawal and what happens next. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry. As long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Catherine Devine, associate producer Gabriella Glick, sound engineering by Matt McArdle, Rosie Don Griffin, Hamsa Mahendranathan, David Lieberman, and Emma Maynard are our contributing writers, and production assistants by Akshaj Turbailu and Anna Salvatore. Our music, as ever, is by the amazing Philip Glass. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.
Now it's time for a new section of the show, Talking Back. It's a special section featuring a question of the week we've crowdsourced from our Patreon members. If you like the work we are doing at Talking Feds, joining our Patreon is the best way to support the show. You get a lot of extra content, and it only costs five bucks to join. The Patreon link is in the episode description. This week's question is from Jeff Morello. Hey, Harry. A uh, question about this recent presidential immunity ruling that came down from the Supreme Court. Does that not apply only to people who become president from now on or, or since the, this ruling has been made? Shouldn't this now only be for people who become presidents from now on? I was just curious, wondered what your thoughts were on this. Thanks. Bye. It's a great question, Jeff, and it seems like it would make sense. They're thinking about going forward, and we didn't know this at the time. But in fact, the rule is pretty clear. When the Supreme Court decides something in a pending case before a decision has become final, that law applies to the very case. Even if it's on appeal or appeal at the Supreme Court, what they say goes for that case and going forward. So in the case of Trump, it's still an open case that hasn't even been tried yet, and the Supreme Court's decision governs. There are special rules for when you apply new decisions retroactively to cases that have already become final. That is, they've already gone through the whole direct appeal process and the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court hears it. Usually they don't apply, but sometimes they do. But in this case, we're still in the middle of the case, so their ruling goes, and that means even though the conduct happened before, it's the current case, the criminal case, U.S. versus Trump, and so the immunity decision in all its huge span and dubious reasoning applies to Donald Trump. Thanks a lot for the question. 